Okay, I guess we are live. Uh, so hello, everyone, and welcome to a, another Berkeley Lab Hangout on air. Uh, my name is Dan Croats, and I'm with the Public Affairs Department here at Berkeley Lab. And today we'll be hearing from uh, scientists from above the Arctic Circle in Alaska, as well as here in Berkeley Lab in California. Um, and our topic today is how and why scientists study uh, permafrost, uh, both to understand the Arctic ecosystem and what may happen to it as the, uh, the climate changes. Uh, this is all part of a Department of Energy uh, project called the Next Generation Ecosystem Experiment-Arctic. Um, and so we're very pleased to have with us today uh, students from two classrooms. We have uh, an eighth grade physical science class from Elmhurst Community Prep, which is in Oakland. So hello, everyone. Can you hear us? Hi. Uh, and a little further afield, we have a class from Ashwaubenon High School in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Excellent. So I'll, let me briefly introduce you to the uh, some of the scientists who you'll be chatting with today. So above the Arctic Circle, outside a, a small town uh, called Barrow, Alaska, we have uh, Craig Wolschlager. He's from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And to his right, we have Craig Ulrich, who's also with uh, Berkeley Lab here. So can you hear us? Yeah, we're doing fine, Dan. Thanks. Excellent. And then after we hear from them, we're going to go to uh, Timothy, Tim Neefsi, and Yujin Wu. And they're here at Berkeley Lab. And um, they use a, the same kind of CT scanner, which you can see behind them, um, the same kind of CT scanner that you might see in a hospital. But they use it to instead image uh, permafrost cores. So you'll get a, a, an inside uh, scoop on why they do that. And after that, we're going to go chat with uh, Neslihan Toss and Romy Chakraborty. And they're microbiologists also here at Berkeley Lab. And they study the vast numbers of microbes that call uh, the permafrost home. Uh, before we get started, I want to briefly introduce you to who we are. We're Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, also uh, Berkeley Lab for short. We're a Department of Energy National Laboratory. Uh, more than 4,000 scientists and support staff work here. And we take on really big science challenges. These are things like clean energy, uh, human health, uh, cosmology, which is the study of the universe, advanced computing and new materials. Uh, we also have an Earth Sciences Division, and they uh, do things like look for new energy sources and new ways to clean up the environment. Um, and they also study climate change, which is the reason why some of them are in Alaska right now. So before we continue, I want to briefly, if I can do a screen share here, show you uh, where we'll be going today. Let me uh, mute uh, the Alaska folks real quick. And uh, let me uh, do a screen share to show you where we're going to be. If this is working. So I think you might be able to see the uh, a map of the United States here. And Berkeley Lab is right here, which is in the Bay Area of California. And the folks in Alaska are way up here on the uh, north slope of Alaska, uh, which is the right here, which is near the town of Barrow, Alaska. And we also have a uh, high school from Green Bay, Wisconsin, which is somewhere over here. I think I'm getting that correctly. And of course, the other high school is in the Bay Area of California. Um, and that's it for me. I, one last thing. We want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, please, if people watching online, you could ask a question on our uh, Google Plus page. Um, you can also email us at askberkeleylab at lbl.gov or tweet us with, that, with the hashtag uh, ask Berkeley Lab. Um, and that's about it. And so now let's take things up to uh, move things to uh, above the Arctic Circle in Alaska. And we'll hear from Craig and Stan. And my first question, which every, might be every, on everybody's mind right now, is how cold is it up there right now? Craig? Well, hi, Dan. Thanks. Right now it's about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it has been colder earlier in the week. Uh, we had wind chills a couple days ago of about minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. We've actually received some snow here in the last couple of days. OK. Do you want to give us a brief introduction to uh, the project and uh, which uh, the reason why you're up there? And then we can hear from uh, Craig on the, sort of the drilling work and coring work going on right now. You bet. Well, welcome, everybody. We're in Barrow, Alaska, as Dan said, about 330 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, I'm here with a team of scientists who are studying permafrost processes on the Barrow Environmental Observatory. And this is a 7,500-acre area of land that's been set aside for research by the local community of Barrow. And we're here this week doing geophysical work. 
We're preparing for snow melt and our hydrology team, which will start in about three weeks. And then we're doing a lot of work using the drill rig behind us to obtain uh, cores from the active layer, that upper layer of soil that freezes and thaws every year, and then deeper into the permafrost, which is permanently frozen ground for uh, thousands and thousands of years. The concern that we're addressing here is that temperatures in the Arctic have increased uh, two and a half to three and a half degrees since the 1950s, and we're beginning to see the consequences of that for sensitive Arctic landscapes. And so we have a large team of scientists that are conducting a lot of studies that you'll see this morning, and we're trying to take that information and understand what's going on and then accelerate the incorporation of that new knowledge into uh, climate models. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with what's going on on the surface, but especially in the subsurface and the soil environment. Uh, and I'll have Craig Ulrich talk to you a little bit about some of the work that he's been doing uh, and give you an overview that will make uh, the work that you'll hear on the CT scan and microbiology uh, relevant to what we're doing here in the Arctic. Excellent. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you fine, yes. Okay, excellent. All right, well, thank you, Stan, for a good introduction. Um, I guess he's moving off. Um, so if you have any questions for him, I'll, I'll grab him to come over in a second. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, what we're... What we're doing to talk more specifically about the drilling and uh, the geophysical work that we do, um, basically, Stan alluded a little bit to about the tundra and that you have an active layer which thaws every year and refreezes, and then you have permafrost that's permanently frozen. And also on top of that, you can see all the white stuff here, which is snow. Uh, we kind of account for the snow depth too. And one thing we do is uh, traditionally, when looking at the tundra uh, or any any subsurface, we basically would drill a lot of holes in order to investigate what is snow depth or what are the properties of the active layer, which is mainly consists of organic material, dead organic matter, and um, a lot of sand, silt, and clay. And to investigate that, and then the permafrost, which is a little bit more uh, usually mineral soil, which is sand, silt, clay, and also uh, some ice and uh, ice ridge areas, and also some ice wedges, which typically form by uh, just give you a little background about ice wedges. Uh, a crack will form at the surface and break open, and water during the springtime will go in and, and basically refreeze, and that keeps building and building and building over years, and you get an ice wedge structure uh, in the ground, which can be you know feet by feet, uh, if not meters. So um, one thing that's, oh, what's it? Can we kill the phone? Um, I don't know who, whose phone that is, but that's okay. <laughs> Sorry, it threw me off a little bit. <laughs> so basically, um, when we want to look at that, uh, at the subsurface, all of those different characteristics of the soil uh, and uh, the permafrost, we basically, uh, if we drill it uh, with, uh, with a drill rig, and we're only getting a point measurement. For instance, like on this core, you only see that we can get information about its depth, but only in one in one location, and we don't get anything about what's to the left or right and what we call laterally. And uh, we need to know that information. Uh, so, um, but we can't see it from what's underneath, you know, what's underneath our feet just by standing on the top of the ground and looking at it. So what we use is we use uh, geophysical instruments um, that will basically. Uh, take different measurements. They're, just, they're sensitive to different things like uh, soil texture, uh, moisture content, salinity, that sort of thing. And it, Dan, I don't know if you have the. Can you put up that first slide? Real quick. All right. And that'll basically give you an idea. So we use a. For instance, the slide that's going to be coming up is. Uh, we use electrical resistivity uh, in that slide, and you see we put a bunch of stakes in the ground, and we can inject uh, current, uh, and current travels through the ground, and we can measure the potential difference between different uh, of those metal, the potential difference between those different metal stakes. And at the bottom, what you see is that's actually a, one of the profiles here that you can't see, but it's behind the drill rig, and. What that is, is you see there's different colors, and the colors represent different things. So, because certain things conduct electricity and certain things don't, much like, much like metal and, uh, and wood, you know, one's an insulator, one's not. So, the red represents um, 
areas that are more ice rich, like ice wedges specifically, and the areas that are more blue and say light green are more areas that uh, have less ice and more mineral soil, for instance. So that's what we're interested in, in kind of imaging with the geophysics. Now that gives us a picture and an idea of like what the subsurface may look like, but we're not exactly 100% sure uh, if that's exactly ice or not. So what we do then is we we come out with a drill rig, and the drill rig then we use that to, to drill down and get cores like we would have sitting here and we'll take that back and we'll analyze that for diff how much sand, percent sand, silt, and clay are inside the, the soil and how much organic matter is inside the soil and how much ice is in the soil in order to then kind of fine tune uh, the geophysics and th then we can use the geophysics further in different areas to do more investigations and help, uh, help the other team members such as the uh, a microbiologist or the ecologist or anybody like that choose where they want to do any sampling too. So um, after we take cores like this, uh, we will usually package them up and take them back down to uh, Berkeley Labs where Tim Neefsey, who will be talking next, takes the cores and he'll image each one of these cores with a CT scan. So I will hand it off to Tim to talk about that or answer any questions. Thanks, Craig. That was a good overview. Um, we might have a, a few issues with screen sharing right now, so just bear with us on that. But while we're yeah, sure. you're still here, um, if you have any questions before we hand it off to Tim and uh, the other folks down at Berkeley Lab, any other students have questions so far from the uh, scientists in Alaska? Uh, folks from Wisconsin or in Oakland, any questions? Just raise your hand and let us know. We could take uh, questions afterwards also, but if not, we'll, we'll now move over um, to Tim Neefsey and Eugene Wu, who are in the Rock Imaging Lab. I'm going to mute Craig now so we might not get them in that wind pickup. Uh, they're in the Rock Imaging Lab uh, in, down in Berkeley, and I think they're the highlighted screen right now, although I'm not sure. And if you could briefly just let us know what you're doing with the CT scanners as well as the other work you're doing uh, once the permafrost cores, I guess, travel from Barrow to Fairbanks to Anchorage, then to Seattle, and I guess their flight to Oakland, and they eventually end up in your lab. So take it away, guys. Okay. Um, there are a lot of really cool labs here at the Berkeley Lab, but this one is my <coughs> favorite lab. It's... it's uh, one of the reasons is that it's got this medical CT scanner, and it's a really, really amazing tool for looking at what is happening or, or what is inside of a sample. And as you saw earlier, as Stan and Craig showed you, they, they retrieve these cores very painstakingly and carefully from the Arctic, and then they bring them back to the lab while still frozen. And so we take the, the cores, we put them in a freezer, and then when we have a chance, we will put them on the CT scanner. Now, looking at this core from the sleeve here, we can't really see a lot. We, we see the top here. Uh, we know that, that there's some, some probably vegetation. And then we have the, the uh, active layer, which is the region that thaws every year. And then below that, we have the permafrost. I'm going to hand this core back off to mm -hmm. someone. Um, so this is a core from Barrow, Alaska that, that Craig and, and his co-workers very carefully collected and very carefully brought back. And now I'd like to, to show you a little bit about what you can see in the, the CT scans. And Dan, can you put up the first slide, please? I'm pulling it up now, yes. So I think everybody could see this uh, CT scan now. So if you're looking at the, the, uh, the slide I just put up, you see on the, the left side, there's a, a regular x-ray image. And some of you may have had uh, x-rays taken of your leg or something if it's broken. But you see an x-ray image of a chest here. And, and it looks a little foggy and a little unclear. But you can make out generally what things are in there. Um, it, looking at the right, you see a CT scan image of the abdomen of somebody. And you can see with very, very good detail what's inside the, the person slice by slice. They didn't slice this person open. They used the x-ray CT scanner to gather data so that, that the computer could compute what uh, the densities are everywhere in the, the person. And so looking at this, where it's white, that's the highest density. And in this case, it's bone. And where it's dark, that's the lowest density. 
and in this case it, it's uh, it's air and so you see some things that are air filled and, and some some bones and then you see other organs that are in between now can you go to the next slide please Dan alrighty the other slides up thank you um, so what we're looking at here in, in this slide on the left side again you're looking at a regular x-ray of the core that we just showed you and at the top of this core you see the active layer and, and you can see a whole bunch of different things that are, are present there so at the very top where it's just going from black to gray there's a layer of um, vegetation and organic material and then there's a, a thick layer of um, uh, organic rich mineral soil and if you look at the first slice over in this, the center of, of this slide you see a, a gray circle that has uh, numerous veins that are filled with ice and the veins that are filled with ice are these these they're a little bit darker than the organic uh, rich mineral soil and so you, you can see that there's a number of these veins and so we have a stack of these slices the interest one the interesting feature here on this slice is something that's going from about eight o'clock to two o'clock there's a, a root and it's it's shown in uh, two places in this slice it goes through a number of different slices and as we go further down through the active layer we get to this region that that's uh, shown in the the CT scan on the far right and that's called the reticulate structure and you can think of that uh, from say a reticulated python it's kind of scaly looking but you see that the gray ice veins uh, and they're surrounding regions a, a, a chunks of mineral soil now when you look at the, the x-ray over on the left again you see how there's large chunks uh, right below the organic soil and, the, and where you go to the brighter mineral soil and then it gets smaller and smaller and then the the orientation of the ice lenses changes to more horizontal can we go to the next slide please Dan? yeah I'll pull that up it's, it's the one with the uh, I guess the permafrost yes so in this uh, slide we're looking at where the permafrost is and I've kind of guessed a little bit about the the actual breaking point from active layer to permafrost but I wanted to show you an image of uh, one slice of, of permafrost and what we're looking at here is the dark gray or the, the gray again is ice and it's porous ice you see little gas uh, bubbles in the ice and it's surrounded by mineral soil so there are, are mineral soil regions there and one of the things that's that's of interest here is we're, we're trying to understand what's happening in the Arctic um, in, in response to climate change and as the Arctic warms what's going to happen to the the the, the Arctic ground itself and so if if the active layer gets thicker every year and more and more of this ice melts you're going to see less and less support for the ground you're going to see water that's produced you're going to see perhaps even sliding of ground that's present mm -hmm. right now you're going to see a, a very different landscape resulting from the melting of, of the this ice and you're going to see organics that are produced as well now we've been doing some other tests here at the Berkeley lab mm -hmm. on some of these cores and I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Yushin Wu who's going to tell you about those uh, those tests that we've been doing great and, and we can hear you, Yushin? Yeah. Sure, yeah, thanks, uh, Tim and uh, Dan. So now, from the CT scan, we can kind of learn the structure of the core, what to do next. Basically, there are two things that, that we do with this course. First of all, we're, we're, the first type of analysis we'll be doing is to analyze them for their physical chemical and the biological properties. Now, before we can do this, the cores need to be cut into small samples so we can, so individual samples can be collected. And this work is done in a cold room where the temperature is kept uh, at minus 10 degrees C Celsius. Um, the, um, um, Dan, if you're going to bring up the slide next. I think yeah, I have a slide of you in uh, in uh, possibly Craig or somebody in the, in the cold right. room cutting up. Yes, so um, it is important to uh, keep the core frozen because otherwise their property will start to change before we analyze them. Now the picture on this slide, uh, the larger picture on this slide shows the cold room, 
uh, where the samples were cut with a, a chop saw based on what we learned from the CT scan. The smaller pictures on the right shows um, the uh, core, um, how the core looks like. You can see a shiny patch in the middle of the core, and that is ice. If you still remember the CT scan images, these are shown in uh, in the gray, uh, light gray colors with a density close to one. After the samples are cut, they're weighed and recorded. Then some of the samples are transferred to analytical labs for their physical and the chemical property analysis, and some are transferred to the microbiology lab for microbial analysis. Uh, Rumi, Dr. Rumi, uh, Chuck Bordy, and the next ten tasks will talk about that later. Now, a second type of work that will be done with this permafrost course is controlled experiment in the lab where the samples were thawed and refreeze in a temperature-controlled incubator that looks much like a regular ref refrigerator. We're doing this to study the freeze-thaw cycle during each year in the Arctic. And you have already learned that the, Arctic la the actual layer of the soil freezes and thaws every year. And when the soil thaws, the microbes become active and, that, and they start to produce CO2 and methane. And uh, these are the two main greenhouse gases that cause global warming. In a, in a controlled lab experiment, the free soil conditions can be carefully controlled and sensors can be installed to acquire necessary data for us to understand how the freeze soil of the permafrost soil contribute to greenhouse gas release and the global warming. Uh, now, when we, if we um, then if you can bring up the the image that you just um, okay, I'll try not, to do another image here. No, that the first image with the core. Right. Um, so in this image, in order to set up the core, uh, it shows that how we set up the core for the experiment. For for us, in order to set up the core, we have to uh, install sensors and get them prepared. And you can see on this uh, image, the picture on the left shows how the soil looks like. Now, this particular core is about a meter long and three inches in diameter. And the top uh, 35 centimeters also is the actual layer um, that saw that freezes every year. And the, pic the picture on the right shows the sensor that are installed along the soil column to record temperature and uh, the free soil state of the soil. And if we turn to the next slide. So I've well, advanced it to the other slide, and we'll see. We're having a little issues with screen sharing today, so we'll see if this takes. But you should see the, uh, the final slide, possibly. But it looks like it's taking a little while to transfer over. So if you maybe want to talk through that. Oh, that's right. OK, so the net, if we can see the next slide, it shows that we have additional um, sampling ports and the sensors installed on the core, and uh, the long tubes that uh, have glue connected on the top are for water sampling, and the other ports are, for, uh, uh, are used for soil sample analysis and other type of uh, uh, sampling. And the picture on the right shows the, the core that's been put together and set up in the incubator ready to start our, our experiment. It basically is set in the incubator where temperature is controlled, and uh, and uh, the, there's an orange disk on the top of the core that is a heater where temperature can be adjusted to control the free thaw process of the, of, of, of the core. Now, during the experiments, many types of data are collected on a regular basis for us to better understand permafrost free thaw dynamics and how that is linked with the greenhouse gas release and climate change. So thanks a lot for that overview, and this is sort of what happens with the, some of the permafrost cores when they come from Alaska and originally make it to Berkeley Lab for both CT scanning and the warming work. And before we talk uh, microbes, which is a whole different sort of ball game with uh, the permafrost studies, are there any other questions from the two classrooms concerning some of the, the stuff you've heard so far with both the CT scanning and the uh, incubation work so far that uh, Tim and Eugene have, have talked about? And we're having a little bit of question, or trouble with screen sharing right now, so maybe we might have to uh, not use that as much in the future. But I'm wondering if there's any questions so far. If not, we could easily um, easily take those after the next uh, after Romy and Neslahan talk.
Do we have a question in Oakland? Oh, question in Oakland. Let's see if we can uh, have you highlighted, and you can take it away. Uh, why do you hold the gloves when you're? I mean, why are you wearing gloves when you hold the core? Why are you wearing gloves when you hold the core? And I guess that's a question for uh, Eugene or Tim, quickly. Yeah, since I have the headset, I'll answer that question. Because the cores are stored in a minus 20 degrees C uh, freezer, so they're really cold, and you don't want to burn uh, burn your hands. So that's why you wear those uh, cryo gloves to keep um, your hands from getting hurt. Got it. We have a question as well. OK. And I apologize, I think I might be the screen that's highlighted mostly during this Hangout, which I'm not quite sure what's happening. Uh, but go ahead, and we'll see if we can work through this. Let's see the chair here. <laughs> Too close. That's it, that's it. All right, how far does the data go back? Or like, how long ago did you guys start going back? Uh, like, that could be another question for Tim and, and Yuja, and possibly. And how far back does the, uh, the data go um, in terms of what you're collecting? Right, the the permafrost, the actual layer, uh, um, the permafrost of the actual in the in the uh, Arctic uh, stay frozen for hundreds of years. And by looking at actually um, when we actually sample the core, we we date the radiocarbon, which is carbon fourteen, that actually decays with time. We can actually look at the age of the soil. Now, some of the carbon were dated to back to um, a few thousand years. So which is um, you know, typically when the soil was formed. So, so, so it, I would say some of the soils were actually formed thousands of years ago. Got it. And that's, uh, let's try to move now to uh, Neslihan Toss, and um, if I can, and uh, Romy in uh, the microbiology lab and see if I can switch over to there. Quickly, can you see yourselves? Yeah, yeah. No. OK, I think I have you guys highlighted now. Uh, hi from the microbiology lab in here, Berkeley. Uh, today we are going to talk about why we are interested in microbes in Arctic. So Tim and you can actually explain to you like that uh, they are very important in the Arctic uh, layer and permafrost soils of the Arctic regions because of the global climate change. So uh, it's been already said, but one thing maybe it's not really clear. So uh, there is a lot of carbon in these soils. So imagine the whole the carbon dioxide and methane that we have in our atmosphere, approximately twice as much is the in the global form in the permafrost soils. So it is very dangerous for all of us on Earth that if this carbon eventually be released back to the atmosphere, that could change our climate even further. So who doesn't change is the microbes. The microorganisms that we work are single celled organisms that are called bacteria and archaea. I hope you've heard it in your biology class at some point. So they're literally everywhere. They live on our streets, they live inside of us, they live on us, they live on the leaves, they live in the soil, they're all around us. So when we get soil samples from Earl, so here's an active layer soil in here on a spoon here for you. There is more microorganisms in this particular spoon than the stars in our galaxy. So there are that many out there. So just like many, they also have their favorite food. So like some of us like to eat bread, some of us like to eat ice cream. Microbes are also like that. They like to live in certain places that they can have access to the food that they like. So I think Dan now will put up a slide for you that uh, I will try to explain to you how they would like to be in the same environment. So, uh, probably some of you have seen NASA has satellites that go over the Earth and just takes pictures of the city. So, when you look at uh, Dan, will you be able to slide up? I will try to do that now. We are having a little bit of uh, issues with screen sharing, but let me see what I can do. Okay. Sorry, right here. Yeah. Yeah, so in your left hand side, hopefully, you are seeing uh, the San Francisco Bay Area where we are located. And if you fly over it on the night, you see all the lights from the sky from every house that has people in it. And on the right hand side, you see a soil that is being uh, uh, colored so that we can see the microorganisms there. And you see the similarities. 
that some of them like to stay together, some of them tend to live further away from each other. They have networks of their own, they like to talk each other, sometimes they compete against each other, that sometimes they share stuff. So there's a whole social living within these uh, uh, soils that you know just changes how they live and how they function. So it is very important for us to know what's in there and what they are able to do. So as I told you, there's too many of them for us to be able to study one by one. So what we do is a technique called DNA sequencing. So we can get the DNA of all these organisms out from the soil and look at their DNA sequence. That helps us to say, who are they? So you are seeing in this uh, slide in front of you the nice CT scans that the team generates. So when I have the sample, I can look at the DNA that is in the soil and specifically look for the microorganisms and their identity. So I can match these pictures with the identity of microorganisms that live in this particular depth. Mm -hmm. So what you see in this graph that in the active layer, for example, the colors are more red and yellow, and when we go through the permafrost layer, the colors changes to black and blue. So each color represents a group of organisms that likes to live in that environment. So this already see that in the of all the soil is quite different than the leaves in the bottom. So that's very exciting for us to start to think about how they're going to respond once their environment is being changed. So what they also can tell us is that what they like to eat. So we can start learning about their life strategy while looking at their DNA. So I can then find out if they would like to eat sugars, what happens if they eat sugars, or if they need to eat something else, can they produce methane and carbon dioxide, which are the greenhouse gases. So when I find these kind of samples that we know that the, there are potential, I hand it these to my colleague Roni here, because so Roni is a specialist on trying to find out how they function. Thanks, Nessihan. So Nessihan showed you this room full of uh, soil earlier, right? What my lab does is then takes the soil and buys different food um, media for the bacteria to grow, and we end up isolating these. Are you able to see the different colors, the different shapes and sizes of bacterial colonies? These are bacterial growing together as a family, uh, so that we can see them and visualize them better on what sort of people. Now, as Nesliman mentioned, they come in different um, different uh, families. So you, you might have a group of bacteria that love to take oxygen just as we do. There are some bacteria that are living deep down in these frozen permafrost layers that have never seen oxygen, and those will die as soon as you expose them to oxygen. These bacteria then breathe carbon dioxide and hydrogen and small different other carbon, and they produce methane. So what you are interested in figuring out what is the ratio of the methane producing microbes to the carbon dioxide respiring microbes? Because ultimately, when the permafrost thaws, we are exposing these microbes more and more to the environment, and what they produce will directly affect the concentration of greenhouse gases. What else we do is figure out once we get uh, the bacteria, uh, the soil bottled up, we put them up into instruments such as the this is the respirometer. What this does, it tells us how fast are they growing, how fast are they eating their food, what are the byproducts that are being made. So we sample from these bottles at their, as they're hooked up, we then assay for what, are the, what is the way of their eating food. For example, say they're eating glucose, sugar. What do they form in between? How does that change when you change the temperature at which you eat them? Maybe, you know, if it's, you can understand if you freeze them at negative two, negative six, they won't be as active as they would be at, say, room temperature, right? Uh, you hear about animals hibernating in winter. They kind of coil around themselves and don't do much. There are some microbes that do that too. They lie dormant. They don't feed as much. They don't produce as much gas. However, when the climate is changing and the temperature is rising, this time we get a lot more active. So they might be producing these greenhouse gases at a way faster rate 
and and way more than they would if they are still cooling in the ground. So the output we get from these machines, uh, I'm not sure if you're able to see this. Uh, it really measures uh, the rate of production of the gases as as we change the different temperatures of their growth. And if Dan is able to pull up a couple of screens about, I want to show you the diversity of these microbes. I'll see what I can do here. No uh, guarantees because we're having a little bit of issues with screen sharing, but I'll see what I can do. All right, so this, this picture you see is a phylogenetic tree, and each color pertains to a specific family of bacteria. So you can see by the different colors that are present on that screen how many diverse families of bacteria we were able to detect and cultivate from those frozen permafrost cores. And it now shows you the next picture over. Alrighty. This shows you the individual bacteria now colored with the stains, just so that you're able to see them better. You see the different shapes, the different sizes, how some of them, as Neslihan was talking, want to click to their friends and partners while they grow. You see them cluster while you see some of them that don't like to be in touch with each other and they are happy to by themselves. So in the microbiology lab, uh, together with the DNA techniques and the uh, cultural physiology experiments, we are able to find out A, more there, B, bring them back to life, study the rates and the mechanisms by which they are chewing on the carbon and figuring out how much of the mineral gases they are chewing out to the carbon which then will inform the modelists in the project to better tell us and predict in the future what might happen if the climate was to change and the permafrost was to be exposed to rising temperatures. Let's open it up to questions, and I'm going to unmute Craig in case there's uh, questions uh, for the, the permafrost team up in Merrill, Alaska. So I have a couple questions that have come in via email, but if anybody uh, from the classrooms has questions, I could easily uh, queue them up also right now. So, Are there any questions from either Green Bay, Wisconsin, Ashwaubenon High School, or uh, Elmer's Community Front here in Oakland? We got a question. Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. So I'm just kind of wondering, like, how did this all get started? Like, who came up with the idea that, oh, let's take ice core samples and, like, look at it? Like, who came up with that? That's a, that's a good question. Um, Craig in Alaska, did you hear that question? Do you want to sort of... Yeah, I think that's probably going to be best for Stan since he's the head of the uh -huh. project. So if I, let me grab him real quick. Okay. Or if anybody else wants to take that question, it's a fair he's, game. He's coming real quick. Okay. He's right here. Question is... Okay, well, thanks for the question. Well, this was a real collaborative uh, activity between four national laboratories and the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And we actually had a lot of input from our Department of Energy sponsor as well. So this is a large project. It's an integrated project. And we started right from the beginning uh, with a strong mandate to conduct field and laboratory research to understand processes for modeling. Thanks, Dan. Got it. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Good. Uh, is there any questions uh, from Oakland? Looks like somebody has their hand up there. I guess I could see that. Um, Let me uh, mute Craig here and maybe try to ask your uh, question again, um, folks from Elmer's Community Prep. Can I come up a little closer? Yeah. Okay. Since there's bacteria in the soil, can it go into through the plants? And then, like, if it's a vegetable plant, can it come into the vegetable that we eat? Uh, that's a good question, and let's let's move that over to Neslihan and Romy, who are our microbe experts here. Well, you know, there's already microbes on the, uh, you know, the vegetable section. That's why, you know, they also tell you to wash your fruits and vegetables very well. So they're everywhere, basically. And some of them, indeed, can be harmful, but doesn't necessarily mean that they all harmful. So, uh, you know, just bacteria, some of them are really mobile, so they can move through the roots, but we don't really know how much they can move off to a leaf that comes to you. But 
just please uh, remember, you already have bacteria on you. Your skin is covered in it. You have a lot of bacteria. to so more cells in you as you are now in your gut than your human cells. So uh, they are part of us. They are very important for our digestive system. When they are not happy, most of the time we are not happy. It's the same for the earth too. So uh, when they are, you know, just uh, functioning in the way that they are uh, not functioning the years before, you know, the systems and the cycles on the earth also. Okay, and I think we have one question for uh, either uh, Tim or Eugene that can has come in via email. Let's see if I could pull that up. Uh, what's the most surprising thing you've uh, discovered with the, your CT scanning or either and also the incubation of the, uh, the permafrost cores? What are some of the surprising things you've discovered so far? Okay, uh, I'll answer the uh, the incubation part, then I'll hand it over to, uh, to Tim to answer why. what's the most surprising thing of the CT image. So. Um, in, during the incubation, um, we've been collecting uh, gases that actually come out of the column. And one thing uh, that we found is that we have this sudden burst of, uh, of CO2 from mm -hmm. the soil. Mm -hmm. Then it, it lasted for maybe a week or two, then the concentration uh, dropped. And we're, you know, that's quite surprising because during the process, we uh, continuously saw the, pump, the soil, so the, actually the salt layer um, getting uh, get increased over time, but we, mm -hmm. we have this CO2 gas flux that actually fluctuate with time. So um, to find out why that is the case, we need to look at the uh, sample we collected and look at the chemical property, the, uh, the microbial uh, uh, properties so to kind of figure out why we have this um, mm -hmm. happening. That's the uh, uh, for the incubation. That's, you know, it's, it's still ongoing, and we actually um, have been running it for a couple of months, and uh, we're, we're still uh, have a lot of questions that that need answers. And I hand over to Tim to answer the CD scan. What What are the uh, I, so Tim? The question that we had from email is: What are some of the surprising things that you've uh, one one surprising thing you've you've discovered so far by imaging uh, the permafrost cores? Well, there, there are a lot of surprising things I've come with. I had a, a picture in my mind of what the permafrost looked like and that there was this thick layer of ice that, that uh, and frozen soil that wouldn't allow any transport of gases uh, through it. But when I look at the CT scans, I see very porous regions that should allow transport of gases. I was also very, very uh, interested in the structure of the soil that's in the active layer. All of those uh, veins that are filled with ice that I showed, um, when those freeze and thaw, they, they, they continuously uh, disturb or, or cryoturb the, the soil. And so it was, it's interesting just to, to watch the, uh, or look at the, the difference between the, the cryoturbation at the top versus the depth in the soil. So um, those are some of the things that I learned. And I think we might have one more question for uh, for Craig up there in Alaska. Can you hear us? All right, because Craig, can you hear us up in Alaska? You muted me. Oh, sorry. I think I've unmuted you. Um, yeah, I can hear you now. So, or I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, the question is, like, as you're up there in Alaska, how many cores do you plan on trying to extract right now, and how long does it take to, to like, take out a core, drill a core in Alaska? How long does it take to get a core? Yes. Well, it's um, it's actually a, a pretty difficult process, um, in that it's it's just difficult because it's very easy to get stuck in the ground. Uh, so, for instance, it probably we hope to get maybe about a hundred cores on the, this trip, and it typically takes us about a half hour. Uh, per core, maybe a little more, depending on how the ground is, if we're drilling through ice or if we're drilling through heavier mineral soil or an area that, like the saline layer, which is lower, that is a little bit thawed, it can be a little sticky. Um, it all depends on how the drill rig responds to that, so sometimes it goes much slower and much faster. So typically, I would say probably about a half hour to an hour to do a core, um, maybe a little more, depending. Got it. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the uh, the two classrooms? I've been told that our screen sharing is somewhat fixed, so I'm not sure what happened there. Um, okay. What's that? From yeah. uh, go ahead. Um, 
can some th sort of extreme climate change or weather condition of that nature throw off the data you collect? And I guess that could be a, possibly a question for, or st you're just wondering if any kind of extreme weather information could throw off the data that you're collecting from the permafrost cores, is that, that, yeah. is that correct? Yeah. Um, does anybody want to help answer that or if we want to have Stan step in? Well, th I'll take a stab at it, if that's okay, okay Dan. Sure, that's so, great. So what we're, of course, everything that we collect is, uh, it depends on the, the, the time and the date and then how cold everything is when it's collected. And so the weather does play a role in that. But what we're really looking for is more of the, the opposite of the question that you asked, is like, what will the effects of long-term climate change be on the ground itself, rather than... What are the effects of a short-term weather on on the uh, data we're collecting? But you have a very good question, and that's something that has to be considered in every core, in every sample that's collected, is what are the conditions the sample is collected under? Mm -hmm. uh, we probably have time for one more question, one or two more questions from the, uh, the two classrooms participating. So now is your chance. You have... Uh, the scientists uh, online now, if you have a, a question concerning the uh, permafrost work and what happens uh, here at Berkeley Lab after they get here on the microbial side or for CT imaging and, and their warming, uh, just let us know because it's the, uh, oh, here we go, I think from Oakland, go ahead. How often do the cores break? How often do they break? Ah, I guess any, you, or Craig, or, uh, or, um, can answer that. go ahead. Break, you're on. Um, as far as um, how often do they break, um, like when you're drilling them, for instance, uh, the, the mechanics of the drill rig spinning and collecting the core and cutting it out um, typically will cause a break in the core. Um, we, we typically don't get a whole piece that's, say, uh, like three feet long. Um, it'll be broken into to sections, could be six inches to a foot. Um, some sections may be longer, maybe two feet. But uh, typically, they, they will break at, at some point from, from the spinning part of the, the, or the mechanics of the, of the drill rig will cause that. Got it. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, one, is there any final questions from the, uh, the classrooms here participating? Uh, one more one. This will be our last question, and then we'll have to uh, move on. Go ahead. Okay, so my question is, I think this might be for Craig and Stan, but I could be wrong. Um, if they are only located in cold climates, how do they tell conditions around the world? Like, how do they relate to everyone here that's not in the Arctic Circle? That's a good question. Probably any number of scientists could answer that, but did you uh, catch that, Craig? So you're doing research in the uh, the Arctic, and how do you relate what you learn in the Arctic to other areas around the globe? Because climate change is obviously a, a global problem, if I understand the question. Right. So the goal of this project, and, and Tim and others can also chime in uh, to add to this, is is that we build these climate models from this these relationships and understandings we have with the subsurface and surface and water drainage and everything. And we can feed all of this into a, a, a larger model, and then that can predict climate feedback or, uh, uh, feedbacks from the tundra here. But we hope that it can be applied, this model can then be applied to areas where there's other tundra, for instance, in Canada or in, in Russia or maybe in like Norway or something like that, anywhere where there's tundra. That they can use this model to then predict how it's going to, how it'll be in other places. Got it. I think that helps answer the question, and um, I'll, that's pretty much all the time we have for now. The scientists, and I'm sure the classes and the students have to get on to other things in the day. I really appreciate you uh, uh, watching this, and a special uh, appreciation, and um, I'm glad that the two schools, Ashwatomon High School and uh, Elmer's Community Prep, participated, and special thanks to the scientists taking uh, time out of their day to participate. If any of Anybody watching or the students have additional questions, feel free to email us or catch us on Twitter for follow-up questions, and we'll try to track down those questions. And uh, I apologize for the uh, screen sharing. The thumbnails weren't always appearing as I wanted them to. We'll try to iron that out for next time. And again, thanks, for everyone, for participating, and see you at our next Hangout. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.